my name is Craig Mitch and what I do is I create content. I produce content, I front content, I work for companies, I work for myself, whether it be my YouTube channel or whether it be me working for the Premier League or JD. I just create content, man, and, and it's something I've wanted to do since a kid. So yeah, that's, that's essentially what I do. Some people would call me a presenter, but I, I don't like to use the term presenter. I think that's kind of extinct, man. I like to call myself like a a modern broadcaster because obviously a broadcaster is someone that can do all of these things to create visual content and I feel like that's what I do so yeah I, I like to call myself a, a modern broadcaster. So basically uh, it started when I was at uni. I was in my second year of uni I think. I met a guy, well I kind of I knew him before his name's Rico. It started with a blog so basically blogs were popping at the time you had the likes of like Tumblr, Blogspot and everyone was making blogs and some of my favourite artists were even making blogs. And I thought, you know what, I want to do this. Like, I, I like posting about music, I like discussing music. So I linked up with this guy called Rico. I, I pitched it to him because he was into blogs as well. And uh, we started a blog called Mitch and Suave. And at the time, all we was doing was just posting music and fashion. Like, we didn't, we didn't know where it was going to take us. We was just doing it. Then we realised, you know what, there's a lot of blogs. A lot of people are doing blogs. How can, how can we kind of separate ourselves from the pack? So we decided that we were going to interview the musicians we were posting about. So we linked up with a guy called Critical. Shout out to Critical. He had a company called Critical Media at the time. He was doing lots of videos for artists and like following them on tour and stuff, but he'd never done interviews and it's something he wanted to get into. So we pitched it to him and he was like, cool, let's do it. So then we just started interviewing underground acts. Like I remember we started with our first ever one was with SAS. And then we did a poet called Sully Breaks, who's my friend and he's doing big things, big things now. Then we moved on to like Essie on his first video shoot. And we just kept building, building from there, man. And then, yeah, eventually we got a break when we interviewed uh, Jessie J just before she blew. So we interviewed her. She dropped her single, Do It Like A Dude. That blew up. We was like one of the only interviews out there. Since it's Mitch's birthday on the 15th. Oh, big 21. He would like a happy birthday. So. Can you just give us a little acapella? Sorry, Sorry if this is bad. Should I hold the mic? Yeah. 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 Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> and then that interview blew up and then from there we just started doing mad interviews with like loads of artists, record labels started hitting us up. So essentially it all started with a blog, like I didn't know where it was going to take us. We wasn't even presenters or personalities at the time, we was just bloggers. And uh, yeah, I kind of made that transition from a, from a blogger to a TV personality. So yeah, that's, that's how it started out. A key thing that happened was while I was in the duo, uh, we met a guy called Poet. And uh, he, was doing, he was doing bits as well. He was known for like doing a thing called Poets Corner and he was blowing up. And he pitched to me and Rico at the time, or should I say Suave, because it was Mitch and Suave. He pitched to us um, something called That's A Rap. And it was essentially like a magazine show that he fronted. It would have different things in it. And he was like, yo, you guys are fly. You're, you're good looking brothers. We, we, I want you to come and do a fashion segment on it. So we was like, cool, let's do it. Like we're into fashion. Like we started doing this segment in it. We did this fashion thing and we'd go to different shops, walk around, give our breakdown on what's hot. We did that, that's a rap was going out. It started going out on GRM Daily, SBTV was getting some traction. We was thinking, yeah, yeah, this is sick. Things are building here. But then we realized that we needed to kind of do something different because everyone was still doing music related stuff. So we decided to do a football show during the Euros. So this was 2012, the Euros were happening. And we was like, look, there's a month for the Euros, four weeks, Let's do one episode per week. We were sitting down in Nando's, I'll never forget this. We were sitting down in Nando's in, in, on Oxford Street and it was me, Suave, Poet, and I think it was a guy called Daniel Riley. Don't quote me on that. Shout out Daniel though. I was just saying it to them like, look, we need to do a show. Why are we wasting time? Like, let's go back. you got a spare room. Let's grab the spare room. Let's just turn it into a studio and make this show, man. Let's, let's, let's come up with a name. And I was like, kebabs like shin pads. Bang. Came up with a name, kebabs like shin pads. Shot. One episode a week for the four weeks of the Euros, four episodes, it did its thing. And that was kind of the point where I realized I want to go into this football thing. But it was also the point where I realized that I don't know if I can do the duo thing because on the show, we were all our different entities. So 
I was a host, Suave was a host, Poe was a host, and then we'd always have like a different female host. So from there I realised, yo, like this football thing could actually be a route and Poet realised it as well. And off the back of it, uh, a YouTube channel called Copper 90 started, it was like a YouTube initiative channel. They reached out to Poet, but they wanted someone to go with him. At the time I was in a duo, so I couldn't separate the duo to come do it with Poet. So Poet reached out to a guy called Vujanic. That was where I realised, you know what, I, I think I want to do this, this thing properly and go into sports as well, because I saw an opportunity there. Copper 90 started, I decided to go on my own path, you know, I told Suave, yo, this is what I want to do. And then, yeah, that's how I kind of made the transition from kind of being in the duo as a blogger, presenter to, no, nah, I, I want to do this presenting thing full time. This is my passion now. This is what I want to do. So I'd say that key moment is when, when I started Kebabs, Ads and Shinpads and we kind of put our imprint and our footprint on the football world. That's when I really realised, yeah, I want to go into this, this presenting stuff and take it further. I wouldn't say age is a factor in, uh, in my field because here's the thing, with television, they'll have you believe that, that age is a factor and it's something, there's like a cut off point, like you need to make it by this, this, this age or it's not gonna happen for you or they're not gonna take you. I think that's bull crap, man. Like I think you can make it at whatever age and with things like the internet now, the opportunities are endless. I feel like people's taking the power back in their hands and if you can, if you can build a demand for what you're doing, because everything's about supply and demand. So if you can build a demand for what you're doing and get the people behind you, then the industry as such will always have to mess with you because it's about what the people want. If you're in demand, then they're going to have to supply the people with what's in demand. So I used to look at age. I used to look at it and think, man, if I don't do this by this age, I, I, I might not make it or I might have to get a real job. But it's not about that, man. You're only as old as you feel. Like me, I look a lot younger than I am anyway. So if, even if there was a cutoff point, you, you wouldn't know how old I am. A lot of people think I'm like 20, 21, but I'm a lot older than that. And I've been doing it for a lot longer than that. So there is no cutoff date, man. As long as you just keep plugging on what you do, you keep persevering, stay dedicated, stay consistent, you will always get that opportunity. Because for me, it's just the law of the universe. Like the, the more you put into something, the more it's gonna give back. So ignore time frames, ignore dates. Oh, I need to do it by this age. Oh, I'm 29, I'm living with my mom. If I don't, I gotta go out and get a real job. Just don't think about that. Just get your head down. Don't worry about how long it's taking. Just have belief, man, that it's gonna pay off because it's, it's the law of the world, man. You get what you put in. My first job was in Woolworths, absolutely hated it. My entry point at retail was like 16, 17, I think. And the worst part about Woolworths was like, I didn't even like, I always wanted to get on the till. I was like, yeah, I'm good at interacting with people. I've, I think I've got this charisma. I can talk to people, I can handle money. But they had me like unpacking the boxes, stacking the shelf. They'd put me on like late night shifts, unpacking it. They just saw me as a young kid that like, didn't have experience. Like the managers used to look down on me like, oh, he's just a kid. Like, and I've got that baby face already. So imagine back then when I was 16. So I hated that. Moved on to my second job, which was William Hill. Hated that as well. I worked in a bookies. I was in William Hill for like five years, man. I was in William Hill for a long time. I started at the end of college, right up until when I left university. I worked in bookies all across North London, dealt with the craziest scenarios. Like I've been held at gunpoint, robberies, had people spit at me through the thing, you know, smash machines, throw coffee. Uh, anyone that's worked in a bookies knows it's, it's bad. Like the reason people do bookies jobs is because as far as retail goes, the money's good. You know, you're earning like 10, nine, 10 pound an hour. You can bang out the shifts, you know, do 12 hour shifts, 10 hour shifts, get money in. But it was just that, that industry so corrupt. I would never recommend anyone to do it. I learned, I learned a lot about myself morally from that industry. You know, they tell you don't, um, don't let people money launder and don't let people, but then they're fully allowing people to money launder. Like they tell people, they say that anyone could put money on, on any horse or any dog, but then they, they lower the odds. And I learned a lot about myself morally from there. After William Hill, I moved on to Vodafone, which was my third job, retail once again. That was when I really made a decision. That was when I, I really decided, I was working in Muswell Hill in Vodafone and I really decided that this isn't for me. I was dealing with people that were kind of middle-class, higher-class citizens and they were really talking to me like crap, like looking down on me. And this is when my, I was, my career was kind of really starting to take off, but it was still, I was still working part time to kind of get money and make it happen. And it came to a point where I had to make that decision. I had to say to myself, am I going to sit here and be afraid of money and just do this half heartedly? Or am I just going to jump out the window, take that leap of faith and whether I have a parachute or not, just believe that I can fly like on some R. Kelly thing, but not some R. Kelly thing because like, 
when man knows what R. Kelly's on these days, boy, but literally I had to take that leap of faith, man. And, and it was Vodafone that really taught me it because I was like, I've worked my way to this point now. Like I've been doing this for four or five years now. I've been doing it solo for two, three years. I need to take this leap of faith. And I did it. I left Vodafone. I got my first job with JD, started presenting for them. They, had, they started a football channel and, it, and then it all came from there. So what I learned from working part-time was don't be afraid of money. Everyone is working in retail, or I'd say 80% of people in retail are working, but it's not what they want to do. And they're doing, they're doing something else on the side and they want to make it happen. And what I'd say is when you get to a point where you get that first job that gives you a good bit of money from your passion, take the risk and leave your part-time job and go for it because then you'll open up more hours. You'll make yourself more, avail more available for other opportunities to come in, if that makes sense. So yeah, once you get that first good bit of money in from your, part, from your, from your passion, leave that part-time job, man. And that's what it taught me. Just take the leap of faith. A typical day in my life. Wow, uh, it quite varies. Like I've got certain, certain days that are structured, but a typical, a typical day in my life is waking up, literally being grateful. I've got like a list of goals on my ceiling. It's mad, it's taped on my ceiling above my bed. So every morning I wake up, I see those goals. So I see those and the top of my goals isn't even a goal. It just says to show more gratitude and be more grateful for where you are. So I always see that as the top one. So that's the first thing I see every morning. And then once I do that, get on my phone, check emails. I mean, at this point in time, I've got a lot of work on. So I'm doing a lot of football stuff at the moment. I'm working with Adidas a lot at the moment. I'm working with JD. I'm working with the Premier League. So my day varies, it varies. I don't have a structured, a structured day as such, but it always involves speaking to my agent. Anyone that gets an agent, I encourage you to speak to them on a daily, keep that connection, keep that relationship. They need to be your best friend. They need to be tired of your best friend. They need to be like your alter ego. Like you need to know them inside out. So speak to my agent every day and just stay in connection with my friends, man. I've got a good group of friends, a good tight circle of friends. And I always speak to them and just bounce off ideas and make sure I'm taking in their vibes. Because a lot of people, they don't realise it. They're on their phone every day and they're speaking to people on WhatsApp, but they're, they're speaking to people that aren't actually giving them anything. They're not, they're not parting wisdom with them or they're not giving them good vibes and good energy. So I make sure I'm always speaking to, to the right people every single day and doing some work in some capacity. I never have a day off. And a day off doesn't mean, oh, I'm, I'm just sitting in, indoors, like doing nothing or calling in sick or, a day off, I mean, you've done nothing to like kind of be productive. So I make sure in some way capacity, even if it's small, even if it's just one email or just one phone call, I always make sure I do something productive. So I'd say that's a standard day for me, just making sure I do something productive. So I started my school late. So basically I was in America, in New York, actually when 9-11 uh, when happened. So the school I got into, I didn't get into it because it was a, it was a new school and it was really packed and the places were limited. So you had to start when it started, but I got held in New York, so I didn't get to start my school late. So when I got back to London, I didn't have a school. So my mom's rushing around finding me a school. So she found me a school far in East Finchley. Shout out Bishop Douglas. And uh, I started late. So I had to play catch up, forming relationships. Now in secondary school, everyone knows year seven, you have to form those bonds. Like in secondary school or high school, if you're American watching this, is that pivotal point in time where you, you make your friendship groups, you, you discover who you were. So I came in late, so I was a new kid. I wasn't even taught at the time, I was short. You know, everyone had formed bonds, so I had to kind of, so I, I kind of merged with the kind of nerds, the geeks in school. We was like on our own thing. We was into like Beyblade, Pokemon, like wrestling. No one really messed with us. And I wasn't really a part of the cool kids. But as, as I got older, I'd say about year eight or year nine, I started finding myself more. I started growing in confidence. I started hanging around with more people, speaking to people. Year 10, I went out with one of the nicest girls in the year. I'm just gonna say it, she was one of the nicest girls. I'm not gonna say her name though. But yeah, she was one of the nicest girls in the year. And then I feel like that made my status go a bit more. Like, everyone's like, raw. how did Craig get her? Like, how did he bag her? I just started getting in more social groups. And then my confidence just started growing. But one thing I always realized was, and just from when I was before secondary school, I loved television. So I always was theatrical. I always played up to cameras. Like I did child acting. So I always played up to that. Like that was something I was always into. But because I came into school late, I didn't have the confidence to do that because every, there was already big personalities and they were already like established. So I, I was a slow grower basically in school. I wasn't always the cool kid. When I came into school, I was definitely a nerd. And then 
from year seven to year 11 was like a journey for me. That's the craziest part. And by year 11, I was definitely one of like the coolest kids in my school. Everyone was like, yeah, Craig's cool, like respected me. So I think that's good, man. Like not many people can say it's a journey for them. Some people kind of start the nerd and end up the nerd and that's their path. Some people start the cool kid and end the cool kid. Some people start the cool kid and drop off. I kind of went like this in school. Not that you have to be a cool kid or anything, but for me personally, that was my journey in secondary school. If I had to pick a song that best describes my work ethic, it would have to be Jay-Z, You Don't Know. Tell you the difference between me and them. They trying to get they ones, I'm trying to get them M's. One million, two million, three million, four. In just five years, 40 million more. That song is the embodiment of, of hustling, of of just going to get it, like just being hungry at all times, like one million, two million, three million, four, in 18 months, 40 million more. Listen, Blueprint, if you don't know about the Blueprint, I don't know what to say, especially if you're a rap fan. If you're a rap fan, you don't know about the Blueprint, then you're not a rap fan. But you don't know is that song, like every hustler looks towards that song. I sell ice in the winter, I sell fire in hell. I am a hustler, baby, I sell water to a well. Bro, if I play that now, it's gonna make me wanna get up and just start grabbing one of these Christmas sweaters here and start shotting them, bro. Like, so yeah, that's that's definitely the song I would say um, inspires me and gets me on my grind. So for anyone trying to get in my field, the daily techniques I used, belief, I just had belief for all times. Sounds cliche, but I did. Don't get me wrong, there was times when, when I doubted myself but then I had that reassurance. I'd say I definitely had the belief. If you're in a specific field, so say it's my field, for example, which is television presenting, you know, online content, you've got to watch people that have done it before you. You've got to do your due diligence. You've got to watch the founders. I watched tons of like old school shows, like The Word. Things from back in the day, man, like people that put on before me. I used to watch Wild and Out Religiously by Nick Cannon. I used to watch Crystal Maze, Supermarket Sweep, like all these dope shows that made television sick in the 90s. Like, I grew up watching that, so I made sure I went back and even though I watched them when I was young, I started watching them again, watching them again, picking up techniques, watching the likes of Reggie Yates, you know, Ant and Deck, the people that have paved the way that come before me, Derma O'Leary. I watched so much Russell Brand, it's unbelievable. When Russell Brand did Big Brother and Big Brother's Big Mouth, I was watching him, like, I read his autobiographies. I just tried to pick up gems from the people that's in my field that have already done what I'm aspiring to do. And that's the best way, like that's the, those are the things that are priceless. A lot of people think I can stand in front of the mirror practice or I can just get up and keep doing it and life experiences will teach me. It will, there's nothing like life experiences. You're, that's the best experience you're gonna get. But you should also study your peers and study the people that have come before you to kind of pick up their techniques. You know, watch their interviews and see what wisdom you can get from them. So that's something I was definitely doing. I was definitely just watching tons and tons of stuff on YouTube, television, because those, that's the field I want to get into. So if it, that's the field, if I want to be a mechanic, I've got to get around mechanics. I've got to watch videos of mechanics explaining things because then I'll be the best mechanic I can be and build that car. And that's essentially what I was doing with presenting. I was watching presenters, I was watching comedians, I was watching people on all the shows that I wanted to get on. So that's essentially what I, what I was doing on a daily, daily basis. So for anyone that's looking for clients or work or trying to get more, more work in their field, for me personally, I got a good circle of friends, first of all. So I started hanging around what I like to call like-minded individuals. So there's no point, like if you hang around dustbin men, you're gonna be a dustbin man. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if you hang around them, that's what you're gonna be. If you hang around with just mechanics, you're gonna become a mechanic. If you hang around strippers, chances are you're gonna become a stripper. So I started hanging around with everyone that's in the field that I'm in. Talented individuals that were hungry and willing to go in the same direction that I wanted to go in. So that was the first thing I did, hanging around like-minded individuals. Second step was I started networking. And you know the saying, your network determines your net worth. If you start hanging around with people that are in the field that you're in, there's only one way it's gonna go. You're gonna end up getting opportunities. Opportunities will fall on your lap. Don't get me wrong, they won't just come to you. You still have to put the work in and develop a product, but you need to have the right network of people around you and you need to have the right circle of friends. A lot of my good, good, close friends do what I do, it makes it so much easier. If you split your friends and have your work friends that you work with and then you have your close friends who do something different, that's cool, but 
think about it. If your close friends do what you do, then you're going to be around them all the time. So it's just easier. So that's what I did. And that's easier said than done because in, you know, in this industry, you don't know who you can trust or something. But that's why it's good to find people that haven't quite made it yet and build with them, but also have a network of people who have already made it that you can get the gems from. So that's what I would say. If you, if you want more clients, just get a good network and a good circle of friends and they, that, those job opportunities will come. That's a fact. I wouldn't say just email hundreds of companies or pester people. Reach out to people. If they, if they don't take on board or they don't reach back, don't be offended. Just keep plugging and putting your product out there and through your network of friends, opportunities will come. So that's, that's my advice. I'd say when you're starting out, when you're starting out, you don't necessarily need a team because what's gonna happen is you're gonna get frustrated. You're gonna want people to help you. You're, gonna want, you're not gonna have money when you start out. So you're gonna want people to do favors for you for free. And then when it comes to them doing things for free, they might not be as hungry as you, or you know, everyone's got curveballs in their life. Something might happen in their life. They might need to drop, out, drop it out and go on a path where they might need to pick up extra and make money. And then you're gonna get frustrated. So in the beginning, what I'd say is, for instance, if you wanna make content, learn to edit, download Final Cut, Adobe, whatever learn to edit, start doing things yourself. Buy your own equipment, do it yourself at first. Obviously, as you get bigger and you wanna expand and reach new heights, you will need a team. Because like I said, you're gonna need certain individuals around you. Um, if you wanna make more money, you need it to expand and have a team because obviously, teamwork makes the dream work. You can't do everything on your own. And, and if you plan to do everything on your own for the rest of your life and be one of those people that's like, no, I don't need anyone, it's just me it's not gonna work, you're gonna hit a ceiling. And that's just a fact. So I'd say when you're starting out and you're burgeoning, you're growing, cool, do it yourself. Don't rely on anyone, get shit done. After that, once you get to a certain stage, you will need a team and you need to find the right team. You need the right individuals. You need to be a good judge of character and be able to weed these people out. So beginning, no team, get it done. Because people say there's no I in team, but there's an I in Craig. So I made sure if there's an I in your name, then cool, run with it or your second name, run with that. But after that, you're gonna need a team. So yeah, beginning yourself, later down the line, get a good team. A personal moment of wonder for me when I thought, that's it, I gotta go hard with this, go straight in, would be when I did the Capital FM Summertime Ball. I think it was 2011. It was 2011, Capital FM Summertime Ball. Yeah, like basically what happened was I came there, I was still in my duo at the time, Mitch and Suave, we've come, we got the jackets on, everyone was looking at us, kind of rating us, someone, Basically, there was one woman in particular who was basically being an idiot. Like, we had, a certain, we had a certain point where we was there to film. She wasn't treating us like, there was all these media things there. So you had ITN, you had all these other media outlets, SBTV, and everyone else was looking at us like, yeah, you're cool. Like all the artists that were coming down, the, like we were interviewed, Rich, JLS, Nicole Scherzinger, JLo. But there was this woman working there. She just wasn't rating us like, she wasn't giving us time. She was kind of trying to hurry us across. She was like, what, why, are you, why are you standing here? Like, you need to move across. And that's what just made me think like, I don't want to come somewhere where I'm not, I, I kind of subscribe to the theory of go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. So I don't go to places where people go, oh, why is he here? Or, oh, like I'm a burden. That's why I don't go Western nightclubs anymore. Because a lot of people go Western nightclubs, they pop bottles, pay money to get in. But you get there, the bouncer looks at you like trash, like why are you here? You come in, people are looking down on you like you ain't got real money and just spending money for no reason. So I don't go there, I go where I'm celebrated. And that's, that's what really dawned on me at that Capital FM Summertime Ball. Shout out to Capital, it's nothing to do with them. This was just some woman there that kind of works for a PR company. And it made me realize like, nah, if I get invited somewhere, people need to roll out the red carpet for me. Not because I think I'm a celebrity or because I think I'm the shit, but I am the shit. Like, You've brought me here for a reason. Someone's reached out to me and Suave at the time because they thought we were cool and, they, and we had a job to do and they wanted us to come interview these acts. So why are you acting like we're, like we're a burden or something? So that made me realize, no, I need to go in because I want to be respected. I want people to be like, yeah, he deserves to be here. Yeah, we need to treat him like he deserves to be here. And that was a major moment for me, man. And since then, I ain't looked back. Like I've just been going hard because I need people to respect me. You don't have to like me. You don't have to love me, but you have to respect me because respect is the ultimate currency, ultimately. That was my moment of wonder. Letting go of fear has enabled me to achieve quite a few things. It's enabled me to achieve peace of mind, which is priceless because when, you're, when you've got fear and you're constantly fearing something, it's always on your mind and it affects you in so many ways. It affects your health, it affects your ability to make great decisions. 
And once I let go of fear, fear of money, like I said, when I was working at Vodafone, the reason I didn't leave is because I, I was scared I couldn't financially support myself or, or do the things I wanted to do. But once you realise that money isn't a real thing, it's, it's just this, it's not even backed by anything anymore. It's just this made up currency now that figures in a bank. Once you realise that it's nothing and you can make it, opportunities open and, and opportunities started open, opening for me. I, 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 like I said, I got that one lump sum of money for a job, quit my part-time job, went for it, let go of fear, started having peace of mind and more opportunities just started opening up because all of my eggs started to go into that presenting television basket. And because I then started putting all of my passion and my effort into that, um, more opportunities came because I was building my brand. So people realised, wow, like this is what he does all the time. So if this is what he does all the time, he's obviously 30 in what he's doing. So more brands, more opportunities started working out. Peace of mind was the main one. Letting go of fear allowed me to get more work opportunities, allowed me to get more money, but peace of mind was the biggest thing and you can't put a price on peace of mind. A special quote I live by, well, the quote itself is actually, time is money, but I don't agree with that. I believe time is priceless because money, you can make money back. You can't make time back. So when people say time is money, I'm like, no, it's not. Time isn't money, time is priceless. I can't put a price on my time. You know, some of the memories I've made, I've spent loads of money on those memories, but they're priceless memories. They're things that will stick with me forever. They're things I look back on and they give me confidence and they, they inspire me and they make me happy. So for me, it's that time isn't money, time is priceless. I don't know why people say that. I know you get paid for your time, but remember, that's just, that's just a salary. And like I said, money is not even a real thing. So I don't understand why people say that. Time is priceless. You gotta use your time wisely. You gotta hang around with the right people. You gotta try and make the right decisions best you can. And just use your time to, to, the, to the best of your ability because you won't get it back. Once that's gone, it's gone. We're all on the clock. Once you're born, you're on the clock. We're all gonna die. So you need to use it wisely. So I'd say time's not money, time is priceless. My name's Craig Mitch and you have just seen and heard the wonders that got me here today.